Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alan Brown. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I'm especially excited to see uh, so many uh, fellow researchers in the audience today, including um, many of you whose work deeply influenced ours uh, and whose contributions to the field have been uh, tr deeply transformative. Last October, Arts Council England issued an invitation to tender for an international literature review on intrinsic cultural impacts, opening up a veritable Pandora's box of ambiguities and abstractions like value, impact, quality, and excellence. I don't know who is more foolish, the Arts Council in commissioning this study or myself for proposing to do it, uh, but here we are. And I have to say, in all seriousness, this has been a, a wonderful journey of learning uh, for John and me. Uh, we were asked to gather literature from around the world on the inherent or direct or intrinsic uh, value of arts and cultural experiences. This remit took us well beyond the question of how people are affected by art in the short term to the larger question of value, the value of arts and cultural experiences to individuals, families, and society at large. Uh, initially, this directed us to the literature on frameworks for value, which provided a rich context for thinking about different aspects of value from economic, social, aesthetic, and other viewpoints. We then dove deeply into the literature on qualitative and quantitative research on the individual impacts of cultural experiences, looking for commonalities and differences across studies. In turn, this led us to an unexpected foray into the marketing literature where value has a specific connotation in reference to consumers, finding a wealth of helpful literature there. Our focus then turned to the literature on the characteristics of organizations that regularly and dependably produce high quality programs attempting to discern patterns across the literature on what constitutes an organization's creative capacity. We had hoped to review a body of literature on how arts agencies around the world think about accountability as regards intrinsic value, but alas, ran out of time and literature. Uh, we realized that addressing the topic of accountability would require reviewing the strategic plans and accountability frameworks of dozens of arts agencies and conducting interviews with agency heads, work which we enthusiastically leave to other researchers. <laughs> the critical reception afforded to the last Arts Council England literature review uh, instilled in us a newfound humility and occasional pangs of terror. Conducting this literature review was a bit like peeling an onion that never ended. Uh, just when you think you've peeled back a layer, there is yet another layer to be exposed, and after a while leads to swelling of the eyes and occasional crying. Uh, but uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity to learn for which we are most grateful and we're thrilled to be here today to just share with you uh, some of the top level findings. Uh, so I'd like to turn it over to my colleague John who will take you through the methodology and some uh, findings. Hello. So thanks, Alan. Um, I'm going to start by uh, talking a little bit about the, the process that we went through and the uh, methodology we used to source the literature and, and then uh, review it, and then address uh, some of the, the kind of first uh, section of our findings, and then uh, I'll turn it back over to Alan. So to uh, start with, I should say that this was really more of an... Ah, thank you, Alan. Uh, this was uh, really more of an exploratory uh, literature review rather than a comprehensive or, or entirely systematic uh, literature review. At the beginning, uh, as Alan indicated, uh, the scope was, was rather broad, and um, the, the, the initial phase was kind of um, uh, just, just setting some boundaries and, and, um, and, and uh, shaping the, the overall outcome of it. 
Um, we didn't really have a, a, a good idea of how much literature we would find, uh, in particular uh, as relates to uh, non-English language uh, literature. Uh, the first step uh, was therefore for us to sort out what people mean when they speak about value, impact, uh, or benefits in the context of arts and culture in order to gain an understanding of how these concepts are framed and uh, to what extent there is agreement about them in the field. We found a variety of frameworks of value and impact, uh, different ways of subdividing them into constituent elements, and different sets of vocabula vocabulary used to describe them, which didn't necessarily translate very well onto other uh, models and frameworks. Uh, nonetheless, in general, uh, it was possible to distinguish between three different levels uh, at which value is discussed, uh, which you can see here. Um, and in, in the remainder of the literature review, we chose to focus, I'm sorry, this is a little bit low on the screen for some of you to see, I realize. Um, uh, we, we focus on the top two, so uh, the bottom one actually isn't that important anyway. <laughs> um, uh, no, not that it's not important, but it's not a part of our review, of course. Uh, so after this uh, initial review of the theoretical frameworks, uh, we set about collecting literature, and, and here our friend and colleague Diane Ragsdale deserves a lot of credit, uh, because she did a, a fantastic job of bringing literature to light uh, in our first round of sourcing. In addition to web searches, uh, searching academic databases, uh, bibliographies, and, and scanning the recent years of publication for academic journals, uh, the staff of the Arts Council was able to put out a call for literature recommendations through uh, IFICA, the International Federation of Arts Councils and Cultural Agencies, and through the uh, British Council. In particular, we were hoping that this would uh, bring our attention to literature in languages other than English, uh, but on the whole, uh, we don't review much uh, non-English language literature in, in this, um, and, and we regret that fact. Uh, a lot of the recommendations that uh, came back um, through IFICA turned out to be uh, rather general and, and only marginally uh, related to our inquiry. Uh, part of the reason for that uh, relative dearth of, of English language, uh, non-English language literature maybe that the language of uh, value and impact comes out of a particular discourse that we're holding in, in English. And uh, we had a conversation with uh, Sarah Gardner and Anna-Marie uh, Laxonen, the head of research at Ithaca, um, who suggested that uh, the language that we're using just might not translate particularly well, uh, and that the debates might be therefore framed somewhat differently in other languages. And unfortunately, because of the time constraints, we, we kind of, we cast a broad net, but we only really had time to cast it once. Um, and, and so uh, we suspect that there's more out there uh, uh, to be found with uh, further digging. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we only had about uh, three or four weeks uh, to uh, source literature, and we're sure that there's lots of important work out there um, uh, that, that we weren't able to include. Uh, and uh, I apologize if that work was uh, written by some of the distinguished uh, researchers in the room here today. Um, I should also point out that our inquiry uh, clearly intersects with vast bodies of, of uh, philosophical literature on aesthetics and uh, phenomenology, but since we were explicitly charged with reviewing measurement frameworks, we felt that uh, that would, would just lead us uh, too far afield, and, and we had uh, quite a lot on our plates as it was. All told, we reviewed uh, 199 works, uh, books, chapters, uh, articles, of which we treat 47 in some detail in our report. Uh, we list all of the, the works that we uh, reviewed for this, uh, all, all uh, 199 in the bibliography, and those that, uh, that we discuss at some length or that we uh, cite repeatedly throughout uh, the literature review, we've uh, printed in, in uh, bold types so that you can identify those uh, easily. In addition, our bibliography includes a section that we, uh, that we called, for lack of a better title, Other Literature, uh, which uh, simply lists other works that we were either just not able to uh, access and review in the, in the time frame that we had, um, or that uh, didn't seem directly relevant, but might still be uh, useful resources for future researchers who are following up on some particular aspect uh, of, of this. Okay, onwards to, um, to our findings. Uh, through our review of the frameworks, we developed the idea of individual impact. Sorry, let me. 
uh, by which we mean all of the ways in which the individuals who experience cultural works are affected by those experiences. This idea cuts across the instrumental and intrinsic debate that has uh, received so much attention, and that it includes all intrinsic benefits, but also the instrumental benefits to the extent that they're experienced by the individual. So for instance, uh, the health benefits uh, experienced by participating in, in dance classes regularly, or the, uh, the um, psychological well-being that might result from uh, the social engagement that happens around the arts events, um, we would count that as part of the individual impact uh, if that person sees those benefits as part of the value that they personally are deriving um, from, from participating. So oftentimes when uh, instrumental uh, impacts are discussed, they're talked about on the kind of social level of the kind of cumulative uh, effect on the population. Um, we started thinking about the impact that a particular cultural experience has on an individual over time an arc that is unique for each person and for each event that they experience. In most cases, we imagine there would be an initial uh, impact spike when the work is first experience, experienced, which then dissipates over time. Obviously, the initial spike will be greater for some works than for others, and uh, for some individuals, they, they will be more affected than others sitting in the same room with them. Uh, but also the rate at which this initial impact dissipates over time, we imagine would uh, vary also. And in some cases, uh, the impact might even increase over time. Uh, if one returns to a work repeatedly over the years and learns to appreciate its nuances uh, over time. So we realized that our previous work on impact measurement really only looks at a small slice of the overall impact, measured immediately or at most a few days after the event itself. But that's certainly not the only moment at which it's feasible to measure impact. And it's uh, not clear that that initial response uh, should be most significant, depending on the art form or uh, perhaps on the objectives of a specific exhibition or production. It might be the impressions that linger in audience members' minds uh, weeks, months, or perhaps even years after the experience that might be considered most significant uh, in terms of impact. This thinking about impact uh, really shaped the whole way uh, we were thinking about this literature review and um, uh, to an extent structured the literature review itself. So we start um, our review with a, a section on the uh, psychological and psychometric responses that are measured during the experience itself. Uh, due to the technical requirements, these methods aren't viable as means of measuring the impact of cultural events in everyday settings, but they uh, can shed light on what people are responding to in their experiences and how that relates to their self-reported measures of impact. We then review a number of studies that ask respondents to review, uh, sorry, uh, to report on uh, their experiences in surveys administered shortly after the event. Here we go into some detail comparing the dimensions of value and impact around which measurement constructs are formed. And we also compare the individual questions that are included in the constructs to see how they align across studies. Oops, yeah. um, this actually was quite an interesting exercise for us. For those who are interested, you can find the comparison tables uh, that, were, that we created in the appendix of, of the study. What we found was that there was a fair amount of agreement among the researchers regarding the constructs, but much less agreement on how those constructs are defined and what questions are deemed relevant. In our comparison of the survey questions, we initially ignored the constructs under which uh, questions were grouped and found that individual indicators broadly clustered around the following uh, areas. Within these groupings, there's sometimes remarkable consistency across the studies. For example, uh, in the questions about emotional response and empathy. But then there are also curious cases in which almost identical questions are featured as parts of uh, different constructs by different researchers. Uh, sorry, I lost my space here. Uh, for example, the, uh, the question whether audience members are motivated to talk about their experience with others is variously interpreted as an indicator of intellectual engagement that the audience is obviously thinking about the, the production afterwards, 
but uh, some researchers interpret that as an indication of the de desire for a kind of social environment and that they're exchanging themselves in a, in a social setting. Uh, this is troubling because it points to a lack of agreement among the research on the theoretical underpinnings of the survey constructs. The next set of literature we discuss similarly seeks to gauge audience responses to particular cultural experiences, but using qualitative methods, interviews, focus groups, and uh, journaling, and so forth. In these studies, the researchers draw out common themes in the responses they receive, and in general, these align quite well with the constructs that are used in the surveys. However, in addition to the groupings of indicators found in the quanti quantitative studies, uh, these also emerge as themes. So uh, one around uh, self-awareness and, and identity, and the other around just um, well-being, catharsis, uh, and kind of enjoyment, fulfillment, and so forth. Uh, th these emerge as themes in the uh, qualitative studies. And this raises questions about the extent to which statistically significant measures need to resonate with and reflect audiences' conscious experience. Is, is this, uh, if this is how audiences talk about their experiences, should they be included even if they are not uh, distinguishable from other constructs in terms of uh, statistics? So finally, uh, we review literature that ask respondents to retrospectively identify impactful events that they've experienced in the past. While this approach doesn't allow researchers to evaluate the impact of specific events because you don't know which event the respondents are going to want to talk about, it does begin to shed light on the idea of extended impacts that are experienced over time, as I was describing earlier. And uh, just very briefly, uh, before passing this back to Alan, I want to mention our, our little um, foray into the marketing research, which, as he uh, said, was, was um, not really planned when we went into this. Um, because our initial take was that while marketing ultimately aims at increasing revenue uh, and is thus more closely related to economic uh, value rather than, than any intrinsic values of, uh, of the experience. But of course, the reason individuals are willing to pay for cultural experiences is because they derive value from them. And, uh, there's a long history of uh, market research, obviously, um, uh, and market research in the arts uh, with a well-established body of theory and methodologies that are uh, certainly relevant uh, to the discussion. And we have uh, Diane Ragsdale to thank for insisting that we include at least a brief mention of these in our literature review. Uh, one of the noteworthy things that we found in the marketing literature is that while it has historically primarily been concerned with the overall satisfaction of customers, which stands in for the probability of repeat purchases, a, study, a recent study suggests that while satisfaction may influence consumers' choices between products, engagement is uh, more important in determining how much of a given product people consume. And that might uh, actually bring the marketing literature even closer to some of the questions that we are investigating here. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Alan again to discuss some of the uh, creative capacity issues. Thanks, John. Well, the first part of our investigation looked at quality as reflected in received impact, either observed or self-reported. Our investigation then turned to organizational characteristics associated with delivering high-quality, impactful programs. What does the literature say about organizations that regularly produce meaningful programs? This investigation could very well have taken us into adjacent fields of scholarly work, including literature in the management sciences, organizational psychology, and so forth. And there's so much more to be done here. Uh, but from the literature we did review, we discerned six core elements of creative capacity. I'm going to go very quickly. Uh, open and frank dialogue about artistic matters amongst board staff and artists is a core element of an organization's creative capacity. To what ends does an organization offer programs? What do they hope to accomplish in terms of participant outcomes and community outcomes? And what risks must the organization take to be true to its artistic mission? Community relevance. The, the research literature suggests that a cultural organization's responsiveness to its community is a core element of its creative capacity. 
Fundamentally, community relevance is a way of thinking, a way of acting that respects and acknowledges the hopes, needs, and aspirations of the community as a guidepost in all that the organization does. This is really about listening, developing a diagnostic capacity to listen, interpret, and understand the community. Excellence in curating. Uh, the third element, at the very heart of every cultural organization is a process of conceptualizing and curating imaginative programs. This element of creative capacity speaks to the health of the creative process, not the outcome, but the process of conceiving, designing, and developing public programs. It draws not only on the talents of curators, the literature suggests, but also an organizational culture that values and supports creativity in programming. Here, researchers make a critical distinction in suggesting that new works of art are not necessarily innovative because they're new, while imaginative presentations of old works may be highly innovative. Technical proficiency, uh, striving to achieve a high quality of technical proficiency skill and artistry in delivering cultural programs is a basic minimum commitment to making the most of an organization's talents and resources. This, this is excellence in a conventional sense. And researchers uh, theorize that excellence in this sense uh, is reflected in an organization's public reputation or the quality of the artistic directors or curators that it's able to employ. And many agree that quality is best judged by outside experts. We know from our own research that programs of what some would consider low artistic quality, for example, amateur productions of stage plays, can generate high audience impacts. And contrary-wise, programs of high artistic quality can leave audiences un uninspired or worse. A capacity, whoops, capacity to engage audiences is the fifth element. Uh, which speaks to an organization's ability to contextualize and animate the work and to help audiences and participants make meaning from it. A great deal of research points to correlations between knowledge of the form and frequency of attendance and donation. Audiences who have deeper experiences and who engage critically with the work are more likely to attend frequently and give. And finally, critical feedback. The museum field has a long history of formative evaluation and refining exhibit design based on visitor feedback, but the performing arts lacks a similar mechanism. The great irony is that most audience members for a cookie would be thrilled to sit down and give you feedback on programming. It seems apparent from the research literature that the process of offering feedback can be a growth experience for audiences in that they learn to formulate critical reflections, critical reactions to the work. In other words, audience feedback done well is part of the engagement cycle and an element of creative capacity. Uh, the literature suggests uh, two additional qualities of creative capacity, which are sometimes but not always present uh, in organizations that produce impactful programs. And those two are supportive networks Uh, networks of organizations and people both inside and outside of the cultural sector, and sufficient capital for taking the risks that an organization must take in order to infuse its programs with new energy. Um, so just before opening it up for questions, um, I'll summarize by saying that the literature on intrinsic cultural value is still developmental in many respects. Uh, especially when it comes to measurement techniques. If anything, our analysis of the literature has heightened our understanding of the limitations of research on individual impacts and the potential for impact data to be misused. While the analysis we've presented does offer some emerging frameworks for individual impacts, the tendency of researchers to deconstruct the value and impacts of cultural experiences into component parts is problematic in that different types of value and impact are integrally intertwined. There's a danger in asking audiences to make distinctions that are theoretically plausible but not meaningful. This is not the Human Genome Project and there is no definitive taxonomy or fixed code to be revealed at the end of the day. 
the impact of cultural experiences is impossibly complex and ultimately unknowable. Yet the need persists to understand how arts and cultural experiences affect people and there are methods of eliciting good data and a great deal of progress is being made. We've learned that the impact of cultural experiences is highly situational and highly contextual, affected by both the participant and the work itself and innumerable situational factors. And the value of the work may not be apparent for weeks, months, or even years afterwards. This raises serious questions about the wisdom of aggregating and comparing impact data across art forms, across organizations, and across communities. Our colleagues working on the Manchester Metrics Project have a lot to say about this. I know, and I very much look forward to hearing them up next on the program. The idea of creative capacity I find to be very powerful. More work needs to be done to further develop a framework for creative capacity, but such a framework could have the potential to focus the field, both organizations and funders, on fostering the conditions under which excellent programs are conceived and delivered. Finally, the study leaves unanswered questions, leaves unanswered some important questions about the degree to which a public agency can reasonably hold itself accountable for end user outcomes when in fact it has little direct control over programming and little influence over who attends. Thank you, and John and I will take a few minutes of questions. <laughs> 